Hi, my name is Josh Pate, and I'm a faculty member at the Hart School at James Madison University, uh, specifically focusing in sport and recreation management. And today I want to uh, provide a discussion that's focused on disability sport and inclusion, and this idea of going beyond the feel-good stories that we often hear or see uh, covered when it uh, is related to disability and sport. And so uh, please allow me to use uh, the most scholarly source of Saturday Night Live to get my point across to start with. Um, when I teach this uh, content in my class, which is a sports sociology course here at James Madison, uh, we always start the class with this video um, just to get an understanding. And I will give credit to Eli Wolf, who is a great advocate of disability rights and disability sport overall, uh, who shared this with us when it first came out uh, in this idea of whether we should identify uh, disability and inclusion as uh, a true recognition of sport, or if we are sort of um, making a mockery or a mascot out of it in some way. Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn it over to our friends at Saturday Night Live, and uh, we'll talk on the other side of this video. All right, so we'll stop the screen share there, uh, and thanks for bearing with me with the uh, uh, content from Saturday Night Live. What we do see here, uh, I'm now going to share my screen with, from a few slides that uh, we'll have. Um, uh, what we'll see here is this idea of uh, Nate, the quote school loser, uh, is a high school wrestler who was allowed to win uh, by another wrestler who was undefeated. And um, the ironic piece of this Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live skit was that uh, it's based around a true story, a uh, true story of a high school wrestler who was undefeated and a multi-time uh, state champion in wrestling. Uh, but the wrestler uh, then uh, had a match against another wrestler from a rival high school who had an intellectual disability. And so the undefeated wrestler um, allowed him, uh, allowed the wrestler with a disability to win the match. And so uh, local news interviewed the, uh, the, both wrestlers and. Um, uh, the undefeated wrestler um, sort of praised the uh, wrestler with a disability and said, you know, it was a great hard fought match and, um, you know, just felt like it was, uh, it was a, good, a good competition. Uh, teammates of the undefeated wrestler credited him for doing the right thing uh, and that the other wrestler, the wrestler with a disability, was someone who was inspirational, was someone who was, uh, uh, showed great um, hard work and great effort. And um, so it ended up being a celebratory time for uh, the wrestler with a disability who actually won a match. Uh, but I think what Saturday Night Live really brings to light here is uh, the general public oftentimes feels like that is the right move to do, to allow someone to enter into a sports setting and set aside the concept of, con of competition uh, for, quote, doing what is right. And oftentimes it's difficult to judge uh, what is the right thing to do, what is the wrong thing to do, um, and, and how to, to create full inclusion. And so I'm hoping that we're going to be able to walk through some of these uh, ideas of what inclusion does look like and does it preserve the idea of what competitive sport can be. Uh, there's certainly a time and place uh, for this type of activity to take place. Uh, but is it good, is it good for the disability movement to allow victories, to put in uh, a high school or youth athlete or even a college athlete uh, with a disability, put them in, insert them into the competition to give them their moment of fame. Now that moment of fame or that moment of victory in these cases of the high school wrestling, it may be a monumental feat, a, a lifelong dream that's fulfilled, but do the onlookers, aside from that moment of inspiration, and I'll put that in quotes, aside from that moment of inspiration, what change does it make for the long term? Does it reinforce that people with disabilities are not good enough to participate in, quote, regular sports? Sometimes it can. Does it reinforce the idea that we have to make special accommodations to incorporate people with disabilities in our traditional sports settings. That is a high risk. Um, so I ho hope that at the end of this, we can rethink the way that we offer inclusion 
within our higher level sports specifically. And when we come to the idea of conclusion, I click to the next slide on slide three, and what it depicts is a, an image of a cartoon. And I'll describe the cartoon here. Uh, it is, looks to be a building. We're gonna assume that it's a school building with a ramp and stairs to go into the facility. And a custodial worker is shoveling the snow off of the stairs. And so a group of kids are at the bottom of the stairs. And uh, there's one member of the group uh, who uses a wheelchair. And that person that we're assuming is a student says, could you please shovel the ramp? And the custodial worker says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I'll clear the ramp for you. And so the kid with a disability in the wheelchair says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So I think that's what sometimes our society falls victim to is that we assume the majority will use the stairs or whatever tool that is to gain entrance or to gain inclusion. Yet the ramp is a quote, alternative method or an exception or an addition that allows uh, people with disabilities to be included. And sometimes our, our society forgets to uh, recognize that the ramp actually would allow all people to enter into the facility. Now the facility represents a structural barrier, but this could be environmental barriers as well. Uh, how are we creating ramps in our society for everyone to be included and not just focusing on the rep replication of stairs for people to be included. So I think those are key elements to remember uh, that go well beyond the structural environment that we are surrounded by and can be applied to some of the more inclusive environments of, um, of how we are operating under this concept of inclusion. And I'm gonna argue for the term infusion, or in other words, making it just simple part of the fabric of what we do. Um, on slide four, I will show an example. Uh, and we're not gonna watch this video for this uh, purpose, but I would recommend you to take a look uh, at a video uh, that is offered by Drunk History on Comedy Central. It provides a lighthearted uh, review of the fight for, for disability rights led by Judith Human, who um, was a former um, federal employee and uh, just uh, a really uh, bright advocate for disability rights throughout the 70s and the 80s particularly and into the 90s and 2000s. Uh, but the Drunk History provides a lighthearted uh, review of it. It's oftentimes good um, for the classroom environment because it's funny, it's got some foul language in it, but it also gives us a pretty accurate historical portrayal of when there, there was a massive fight just for the basic rights of physical acceptance and, and um, environmental acceptance of structural acceptance of inclusion that was led by Judith Human uh, in San Francisco, starting in San Francisco when they uh, sat in and protested in a federal building uh, for um, nearly a, a month's time. And so that led to individuals chaining their wheelchairs to the transportation buses, the public transportation in San Francisco. It led to individuals marching on Washington and climbing, literally getting out of their wheelchairs at times or laying down their walking devices um, and climbing up the stairs of the Capitol building to stage a protest inside the rotunda of the Capitol building. Uh, in, the, in the fight to have legislators uh, sign the 504 uh, bill that established the, the groundwork for disability rights and later was um, supported in a much more in-depth way through the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'll move to slide five and it gives the, the legal language of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. But I think one of the things that um, I like to highlight here is we're not talking about providing specific or, or reinforcing specific access for people with disabilities or giving them priority, what we're simply talking about is equal access, equal opportunity, I think are the key words. Um, and I'll highlight this here, uh, guaranteeing that people with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else. I think to me, that's the critical piece of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And what the sad part is, is that you can see this was signed by George Herbert Walker Bush in 1990 and enacted as a federal law. And yet, here we are in 2020 and beyond, and we still face barriers in our society uh, to promote full inclusion of people of all kinds of disabilities. Those disabilities that are visible and that we can see, as well as those disabilities that are hidden and maybe we can't recognize just through our visual optics. Um, I'll click over to slide six, and I'll a little self-promotion here. That's me. 
uh, on a buy ski over in West Virginia uh, with my friend Chris, who's my instructor. And uh, but I just want to highlight that um, when we think about sport, snow skiing, water skiing, hand cycling, those are some what many people would see as um, alternative sports, not the traditional sports of North America, uh, football, basketball, baseball, hockey, soccer, uh, but we're going a little bit beyond that frame. And I think that's where we can see some innovative approaches for inclusion of people with disabilities, even with the idea of exercise and fitness. And on a college campus, that can be highlighted even more so when we're talking about a campus recreation and how they're including students with disabilities of any kind of disability. What is the lighting like? What is the environment like? What's the noise level like? What is the physical space like? Um, are there adaptations to allow me to participate in a ropes course? Are there um, uh, equipment, is there equipment properly in place there or spaced out properly so that I can use it uh, in a healthy and safe way? Uh, those are areas, even the communication of this inclusion can be areas that a campus recreation organization or a community organization can really work on uh, to promote inclusion of disability without spending a lot of money. I think the first thing that a lot of these campuses want to do is go out and buy sport wheelchairs to play wheelchair basketball. And while that's a very lucrative opportunity for students of all ability levels, it's also a very expensive opportunity where a campus may have to spend upwards of $25,000 to $30,000 just for the equipment. But uh, some different types of physical activity and exercise and fitness can simply make an adaptation to be more inclusive and with uh, zero expenditures at all. We'll move into slide seven and this idea goes back to sort of the title of this presentation, uh, moving beyond the feel good stories. Uh, what we see oftentimes, especially through media portrayal of disability sport is that anytime disability is included in the coverage or the promotion of sport, uh, it's usually a special story or a feature story or a you won't believe this type of story. Uh, it becomes inspirational. And many researchers have labeled this as inspirational porn. Uh, so in other words, um, I'm so in awe of the fact that you're doing something that's physical activity that it really, I can't take my eyes off of. It's like slowing down at a car accident um, where we have to make sure that we get that good look uh, to fully understand in most cases, that's simply because we haven't seen it and it's not normalized in our society. So this takes on this concept um, that's also another term in the literature called supercrit. And this has been extensively researched, particularly by a couple of researchers that I'll note uh, with Marie Hardin and Michael Cottingham. Um, and this idea that uh, almost a, of a superhuman performance. Uh, so in other words, she competed despite suffering from disability. Um, it assumes that disability creates this idea of suffering, or it assumes that disability would prevent someone from competing or even participating in some way. And so um, it almost creates this iconic figure who is performing at that level to be superhuman. Um, so all of these examples really adhere to the medical model of disability. So when we look at disability, there are multiple models and lenses through which we can view disability. But the medical model is, I'm gonna highlight two polar opposites. And number one, focus on the medical model. It's a bit of an outdated approach or an outdated model to view disability. It views disability as a problem. It's something that can be corrected or cured. Uh, it's something that we can fix because it's not normal. Um, so in other words, uh, we, we are not adapted to it so what can you do as the individual who has a disability, change, what can you change in order to adapt to our world or the world that we live in? Uh, so it's a little bit of a reverse of what maybe our expectations should be. Um, the, one of the reasons that this is an outdated model is because of the language that's often used. And this term handicapped, disabled, or crippled um, are really outdated terms and disabled only when we use it before the individual. Now this is a little bit of a controversial idea of the language. Um, some people prefer to just use disabled person. Certainly in parts of the, uh, Europe and across the UK, uh, this concept is um, more so welcomed by use of term disabled person. But mostly in North America, uh, there's this adherence to person first language where we would instead say person with a disability. 
Um, crippled is an outdated term, and I'll even suggest that the term handicap is outdated. Handicapped, unfortunately, though, when we go see the blue, uh, the blue parking spaces that are termed accessible parking spaces, they will still say that I say that the, the language handicapped parking. Um, and so this is, I relate this back to this, uh, the idea of race. Uh, and so, so many terminal terms and words that in the 40s, 50s, and 60s were used in society and used frequently. But in 2020 and beyond, those terms are severely outdated and, and no longer used and no longer accepted and frowned upon. This is a similar case with these types of words such as handicap. Uh, but but we're, we're being slow to adjust our language. And I think in the sport world, we can be leaders in that area if we adopt language in, in a proper way. And the reason I say that is because research over and over shows that if we make social change or promote social inclusion, it often starts with the language that we use. So I'll move into slide eight here and I'll give a definition from Gutman in 1978 of sport that includes these elements that I often use this in class, although it is uh, several years dated. Uh, but the reason I bring that up is because if we want to properly include sport uh, in our fabric uh, and pro properly include disability in our fabric of coverage and, and understanding of sport, then we have to understand where it fits within sport. Uh, and we have to adhere to that in some way. And I think where the disconnect is, is that we are including disability as a lifestyle conversation or as a special topics conversation or a special feature story conversation. And that's where we're not really giving it its due diligence as a sport. Um, we're not adhering to the social model. And this is the polar opposite of the medical model. Uh, and the social model suggests that disability is not the individual's issue. It's not an individual's problem, if you will. It is instead, it's society's problem because society as a whole has not adjusted. The curb cut is not properly placed because society doesn't understand how to serve the population. The button is not on the door to make an automatic door open up or the door knob is round and not a lever uh, because our society is not adjusted to what the needs and preferences of everyone or the majority of people can be. So the social model also suggests that disability is simply a quality that individuals have, just as race, gender, ethnicity, um, sexual orientation can be a, a feature that is a part of an individual. It does not necessarily have to be the number one descriptor of that individual. Although we often make it as a society, we make it into the top uh, descriptor. Uh, and under this, the social model, there is a preference for person-first language. And I mentioned that earlier uh, in the medical model description, a lack of person-first language. And I'll move to slide nine. And what's included on slide nine is comes straight from the University of Kansas. Uh, and they have a, a resource center there for disability and aging adults, which provides a great uh, example of what words to avoid and instead what words to say. And this is, is adhering to the person first language notion. So a couple of things that I'll highlight here is this concept of wheelchair bound. Someone, this is often used in, in media reports where someone is quote wheelchair bound. And it really disturbs me because it sends this message of someone who is duct taped and held hostage to their wheelchair. The ironic part of that is that the wheelchair actually promotes freedom for many individuals and allows them mobility. So there's nothing confining about that wheelchair. Although they may use that as a mode of transportation, that is, their, that is a method oftentimes for individuals, not in all cases, but oftentimes it's a method of freedom, a method, a method of movement. Uh, it's part of that individual. I myself have a disability. I have cerebral palsy and I'll walk with forearm crutches. Uh, and the way of I've explained the way I've explained it is my crutches are like my shoes, are like my a piece of my leg, a piece of my body. They help me to move. So it's just a feature. It's not confining me. It helps me get somewhere. So I think that's one area that I would highlight that is oftentimes confused. Um, I'll move down to uh, this idea of suffers from. Sometimes uh, we confuse the concept of suffering. Uh, with just maybe different or unique or maybe the fact that I haven't seen that before. Um, I will highlight right below that uh, the R word is used and that is 
completely outdated and a very much a no-no. There's a whole uh, movement within the disability community to end the R word. Um, unfortunately, for a younger population and, and even in, a, in an older generation at times, that R word is used to, um, to downplay or disparage something, to explain that something is bad or negative. Um, and what that does is that associates people who do have intellectual disabilities as being down or negative or a problem. So uh, we need to be mindful and careful and aware of the word choices that we use. Um, and then finally, uh, one thing that's not really on here is um, the idea of autism. And autism is one word that, uh, one um, situation where we often as a society use uh, the term that person is autistic to describe the individual, which that does not adhere to person first language. We're labeling the individual under that scenario rather than simply describing a feature that's part of a plethora of features that the individual does have to offer. So language, again, is the precursor to a social movement or social change. So I think it would be in our best interest, particularly in the sport world, where we're seeing constant, uh, constant opportunities to be at the forefront of social change through sport. This can be one of them if we start you know, using the proper language, depending on where we are within the world. And then finally on slide 10, I will point to an introduction to a special issue that's provided by Mr. and Darcy from 2013. So it's, um, it's several years old, but I still use this in classes to, uh, because it provides some, uh, some idea of how we can integrate people with disabilities in a variety of ways. So uh, this idea of the inclusion spectrum, how are we including people with disabilities? Fully included, meaning everyone participates without adaptation or modification. So in other words, if you and I were playing ping pong, I'm going to play just like you're going to play and we can have a great competition. I may beat you. You never know. Uh, if we're modified, integrated, that's when people with disabilities participate with some modification to the rules or the equipment. So um, if a golfer uses a, uh, a golf cart in, in, a, in a high school golfing match and, and golf carts are not allowed, we're modifying some of the rules so that the golfer can fully participate. Parallel activities and when people with disabilities participate in the same activity, but participate in their own way. This may be where uh, an example would be a road race or some sort of 5K, half marathon, marathon, where we see a wheelchair division. Uh, so it is a rolling uh, um, rather than, full, than the traditional running or walking. But I think that even the language, and if I see a 5K advertisement come across and they don't include the idea that someone can run, walk, or roll, then I think that sends a message to me as to how educated they may be about the full inclusion of parallel activities. Are they even offering that as an alternative form or a different division within the race? That's where we see parallel activities. Uh, and then next we have adapted activities. Um, this is when uh, participation and activities are designed for people with disabilities, but people with and without disabilities can participate. So in other words, uh, that's where something like wheelchair basketball would come into play, or goalball. Goalball was a sport that was designed specifically for the blind and visually impaired uh, population, but anyone can participate by put, because every athlete puts on goggles that are blacked out and, and participates under those rules. Similar to wheelchair basketball, if you're participating in wheelchair basketball, you're sitting in the chair and you're adhering to the same set of rules. So, uh, and then finally, we see discrete activities where people with disabilities participate in similarly um, peers with similar disabilities. And so um, that a good example of that is uh, the Paralympic Games or Special Olympics, uh, where we will have uh, two different or multiple different divisions across one uh, event. For example, the 100 meters in the Paralympic Games will have different classifications based on the way that individuals compete, whether it be single and double leg amputees, uh, people of short stature, uh, maybe people with uh, upper body in, uh, amputation. Um, so there's where we see people that are classified according to their ability level, and they can compete against people of similar ability levels. So I'll stop my screen share there, and I'll thank you for attending this, uh, this video lecture. I hope you find it useful. Um, I am very happy to uh, communicate more about this or have any conversation about this that you would like to have. 
I hope that has uh, provided some sort of insight on the idea of inclusion because we can go beyond these feel-good stories. These, uh, it doesn't have to be on Sports Center once a month or once a year about how this athlete or this individual was so inspirational and made us feel good. Inspiration in this idea is an action word. So if we're inspired because someone with a disability can participate in a 5K, then that means we're probably going to be moved to go participate in a 5K ourselves. Um, so I think oftentimes that idea of inspiration is thrown around too loosely. Maybe we are in awe of that uh, participation, or maybe we are encouraged by that participation. But inspiration is not necessarily the right word in that scenario. We need to move beyond just being uh, having this feel good, warm feeling inside when someone with a disability does something well and simply recognize those athletes or those individuals in daily accomplishments for the very accomplishment that they've made. Not necessarily the fact that they're surprising us by what they're doing because we haven't seen it, but instead because their accomplishment in and of itself, regardless of any quality that they have. We don't do this, uh, we do recognize like first black uh, athlete to do this, first female athlete to do this, but uh, we don't overhype it and over celebrate it much like we do in the disability world uh, when, because it's not as uh, shocking, I think, to our society for some reason. So that's where I think young professionals need to really work on to normalize disability within our own education patterns and within the world of sport and what we're doing. So um, my name is Joshua Pate and I'm a faculty member at James Madison University in the Hart School. Uh, and uh, my email is p-a-t-e-j-r at j-m-u dot e-d-u. I'll be glad to have this conversation with you offline uh, if you're so inclined. So um, once again, thank you so much for everything, and I wish you all the best.